Michael Osman and Dominic Spill talking about unambiguous encapsulation. Do we have the same? <laughs> <laughs> All right, how's that? Is that good? Can you hear me? No? Yes? How's that? All right. Thank you, Adam. Thank you, Shmukhan. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Um, unambiguous encapsulation, separating data and signaling. And, uh, we're going to use the word signaling sometimes in this talk. Uh, also, we'll use the word is that there's the Shmukon drinking game, and this year the word is metadata. <laughs> right? <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> so uh, if you haven't started already, right, take a shot every time somebody says metadata. And so, so just so you know, especially if you're playing along, uh, or if you're playing along at home, we're streaming, streaming right, Ted? We're good? We, uh, uh, when we say signaling, we mean metadata. Sometimes we talk about uh, inner data or outer data. We're talking about encapsulating data within other data. Uh, so if we say outer data or signaling, we mean metadata. All right. So uh, I'm Michael Osman. Uh, this, I s started this project, and you may know me from various open source hardware projects that I do for pri primarily uh, for the hacker community. Um, and I started Grace Got Gadgets actually here at ShmooCon uh, for that purpose. And is this one on? And I'm Dominic, and I work on Ubertooth and various other USB related sniffing things. Generally, if, if something communicates using packets, I'm interested in trying to sniff them. Um, and that's mostly what I do. Yeah, we, we kind of want all the things. So. Um, <laughs> Dom <laughs> Dominic also has a, uh, a talk tomorrow morning that you should check out on uh, uh, USB, USB man in the middle stuff. That's pretty cool. Um, and uh, so th this is a where you've probably seen in a lot of uh, cyber fast track supported projects. So we are glad to be uh, among them. The is the problem of encapsulating data within other data. And what we mean by unambiguous encapsulation and why we think it's important. Um, and then we're going, going to talk quite a bit about error control codes. Um, and uh, we'll explain why we think that's important to this project, although uh, the concept of unambiguous encapsulation is something that goes far beyond. Um, and then we're going to talk about our, our, our work on specifically finding uh, particular codes that can be used to support unambiguous encapsulation. Um, and, and I project very much because I was inspired by the Langsec research. So if, you're, if you are familiar with it, you, you'll probably quickly see why this is related. Um, if you're not familiar with it, uh, definitely look it up. Um, just look for like the Langsec page and read everything you can possibly find there because it's all good stuff. Um, we were also inspired by uh, packets and packets. Um, the paper by Travis Goodspeed and various neighbors, at least one or two of whom are in the room. Um, the, uh, uh, this is a really exciting thing that we'll talk a little bit more about. Um, and so that, that's what kind of led us to think about how we encapsulate data within other data and um, how that often is done ambiguously and that can be a problem. All right, so can I just get a show of hands? Who has heard of and uh, some packets and kind of knows how that works? Okay, I'm gonna give a very brief run through now for, for anyone that doesn't, because it's a great example of the problem that we're, we're trying to solve. Um, so what he attempts to do is hide inside the payload, which can be user controlled, of another packet. So the idea being that he puts some, puts, crafts an entire packet, header, payload, the, the whole thing, and puts it as the data he passes down to the um, down the OSI stack, and at some point when it's being, if you're lucky, there's some noise or a glitch or interference or whatever, the receiver to miss the start of frame header, and and miss um, being able to identify that frame, and because what those that receiver is doing is just looking for that start of frame header, when it gets to the point in the transmission of seeing your payload. It goes, oh, there's a start of frame header here. This must be the start of a packet. And so it allows someone else's network as long as the environment is noisy enough and you can, you can send um, high levels of payload data in there. 
Travis showed this to be, uh, which button is it on your? Oh. No, sorry. Yeah. Uh, Travis showed this to be possible on Zigbee networks. We're fairly sure it should work on 802.11, but we haven't shown it, no one's shown it yet, and there are scramblers and things that, that make that different. So this, this image is, is um, Travis doing it on, on, a, um, on a Zigbee connection, and you'll see through that list, um, he's getting the, the whole packet correctly received the whole time at the beginning, and then he gets to a point at which uh, there's some noise, which causes it to miss that, that start of frame on the, on the left-hand side, and it picks out his inner packet, um, which is highlighted with the, the tags. So credit to Travis for this, 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 this very brief overview of his talk, and I very much recommend you go and find a video of it. He's given it um, as a presentation in a number of different places. It's well worth looking at. Um, and this year, uh, Andrea and Danielle from Inverse Path managed to get the same thing working on wired Ethernet. And um, they got it working on wired Ethernet when they unplugged and then replugged in the cable. And they were able to, to glitch the, the system up. And um, Ethernet's very slightly different in that the end of frame delimiter that says this is the end of a packet cannot be injected into a packet. So what they had to do is with making sure their CRC matched and then packing their fake packet right at the back end of the payload. Um, so you need to know how big your, your packet sizes are. You need to be able to fudge the, um, the CRC data. And there was something else in the talk that you wanted to bring up, was it? Oh, uh, they did a, uh, they actually, in addition to doing packet in packet, uh, on Wired, you could exploit a parser differential basically at the physical layer. Uh, so that they could, like, a passive network tab, for example, <laughs> uh, which was pretty, pretty awesome. Right, so they were able to craft packets that only certain NICs could right. receive. Right. right. Yeah. Um, buffer overflow attacks, because in the, what's happening in these attacks is you're mistaking um, real data, you're, you're getting them confused, because you are trying to maintain state, and if the maintaining that state stops you from working out what, which state you're in, then, um, then you end up seeing what you believe is a, oh, changing into the payload state, or change, this is a new packet. And um, with buffer overflow attacks, it's the same thing. We're writing data, but we're then and executing it as if it's, um, it's code. And um, it's, it's a very similar technique, and, and actually our method could solve both problems. Um, if you have a piece of data and you require some knowledge of the state of the system to work out what the meaning of that data is, then it's ambiguous. And it, you need to be able to tell the difference between your, your metadata, your packet headers, and, and things like that, and, and your payload. Um, and it's the ambiguity that lets us exploit the packets and packets. So I'm going to give an example um, which we wrote as the, the, the sort of opening to this project, um, which is we. We use this as, oh, it's not even an analogy, it's a, it's a good example. So the CSV file, right? Everyone's familiar with the CSV file. It's used all over the world, far more often than it should be. And um, you, fields are separated by a comma. But it's perfectly reasonable to want to put a comma into one of those fields. Uh, and, and we separate the records by new lines. And it's perfectly reasonable to want to put a new line inside one of those records. We, how do we handle that? Well, what we do is we escape them. So you might use backslashes, you might use them, you might quote a, a field, but then you've got to escape your quotes if you want them inside your field, and so on and so forth, and it just, it's escaping and quoting all the way down. Um, and you have to remember whether you're in or um, escaped or not to understand what the meaning of a comma or a new line is in that. If some noise or interference is transmitted, then potentially you could lose that state. You could misread a quote or misread an escape and, and um, introduce errors. So um, it's also not strictly straightforward to implement. You'll, you'll spot at the bottom here of this, this slide, there's a, um, a little search we did through the, the Python CSV module. And there are four, um, four functions that involve the word guess in their function name. And be the method I'd like to use to decode my data. <laughs> Like, I'd, I'd like to be able to read a piece of data and know that what I'm going to wrote, not something that a Python programmer has guessed at with their, with their algorithm. Um, 
And various people use different escaping methods, and you don't, with most CSV pods, the character, and then, so you need to know what your delimiter is in order to uh, know how your escaping works, and it gets complicated. So we came up with a base64 delimited file, um, file format. So we all used a CSV, but we largely kept it the same, and we took away a fairly key feature. Uh, every field is base64 encoded, and then we separate them with commas, um, full stops, and we also added in the opportunity to put in headers, because this is creating uh, tables and things like that so often that you might want a header row. And so we put them in, and they have different, um, different uh, escaping and, and encapsulation. And none of these characters appear in base64 encoded data, so there's no way you can mistake a delimiter for some data. So we have an example here, three cons that I'm sure you're all familiar with. And you'll notice that if this is a CSV file, we have to quote Washington DC if we want to put a comma in there. Um, and now in base64, it looks like this. Now you'll note that the one feature we don't retain from CSV is human readability. Um, Unless you're Sergey. Right, yeah. <laughs> Certain people probably can read that, but Sergey being one of them. But uh, it, it depends on file formats that, that probably provide similar things without the readability. But it's, it actually wouldn't be too difficult to write a parser for them. It's pretty straightforward. All you've got to do is split the string on your delimiters and then just base64 decode them. And base64 decoding is generally a solved problem in any programming language that has a reasonable set of standard libraries, and it's straightforward to do. And in fact, we have a decoder that's uh, targeted for the hammer part. And so we can create CSV files that are base64 delimited, and they're completely unambiguous in the, um, the way we handle each character as we read it. We don't Yay need hammer. to. Hmm? Yay, hammer. Yay, hammer. <laughs> OK. <laughs> Um, and you can find that on you can find that on GitHub. That's in the repository with uh, along with all the other code that we're going to uh, talk about. It's all open source. It's all under a GPL license. GPL two. Yeah, all right. GPL two. Um, and Dan Kaminsky has Interpolik, I think that's how you pronounce it, which is a, a similar method for working with uh, SQL injection in PHP, um, and it's it's relatively similar to, to get around exactly the same problem um, of, of delimiters not being in the base64 set and uh, to your advantage. So ambiguous encapsulation, this is just a repeat of the earlier slide, we, we can't do and we can't know the, um, know the meaning of a character or a bit of a mission without knowing the state or the context that, that we're currently in. Um, and what we want is unambiguous encapsulation. So it's just the opposite. We want to be able to take a piece of data and with any external information, any, um, any kind of context, we want to be able to determine what that means. So the base64 file, um, file format manages this because we know for every character, is that in the base64 set or is that in one of our delimiters? And one or the other, it's never in both. Um, and that's what we're trying to achieve. And that's, that's, I think, a fairly good example of what we're trying to achieve with this project. Um, but obviously, we're not trying to achieve it at the um, CSV file level. So we are both particularly interested in communication systems, communication protocols. And um, one of the things that we've found is that we keep finding that it gets more and more interesting the closer to the physical layer that we get. Um, and this is true that you know, all of our bits are, think of them digitally all the time, but fundamentally they're living on some kind of an analog medium. Um, and if you, if you haven't found that analog medium, if you're not sure where it is, uh, you, you know, you'll find it. It's there. Uh, every packet we transmit over a network, every chunk of, of bits that we store onto a storage medium, it's all analog. And at some point there's a boundary between analog and digital. And at that boundary, we often use error control codes. Um, and these are, uh, we think, a natural place to use this concept of unambiguous encapsulation. Because we're already using some kind of uh, redundancy 
in the we're, we're adding extra bits for for parity uh, where where and it's a natural place where we could kind of divide that code into multiple sets where we could have like one set of of uh, characters or one set of code words that represent uh, kind of outer data or metadata and one set of, of code words that are data and uh, this could, you know, this concept of unambiguous encapsulation, we, you, we can use all over the place, anywhere you embed uh, or encapsulate data within other data. But we think that any place that error control codes are used uh, is a natural place to consider doing that. So what we're interested in doing with this project is, is trying to find error control codes that, are, that have particular properties that are useful for unambiguous encapsulation. The uh, error control codes in general, and specifically the ones that, that we're working with at this point in our project, are, are codes that encapsulate data in words. So uh, a code word is like a string of bits, for example, and it particularly represents some piece of information. Um, and we're dealing with, uh, specifically right now, binary linear block codes. And if you don't understand everything that's on the screen right now, don't worry about it. Um, there really isn't that much about coding theory that you have to understand to understand what we're doing. Uh, coding theory is kind of a big field with a lot of complicated math that mostly we don't care about for this project. Um, a linear block code um, that is kind of a, the classic example uh, it's called the 743 Hamming code, or it's called the 74 Hamming code, or sometimes it's called the Hamming code, uh, although because uh, it, it, it's kind of the, the simplest example and the first one, I think, that Hamming published. Um, and uh, he was, by the way, uh, I believe this code, the, uh, this, this encoding technique, um, was that he was working with punch card systems, and he was... This is the story is that he was frustrated with the, with the uh, unreliability of reading the bits off of the punch card uh, correctly. You know, the ones that were supposed to be read, you know, you write some to a punch card, you read them back, and you get errors here and there. Um, so he was trying to deal with that problem. Uh, so the 743 Hamming code is, a, is made up of these 16 code words. Each of these code words is seven bits long. It has a seven, four, three code. The seven means the length of the code word is seven bits. Uh, this, this code, so if I want to transmit some information to Dominic, I pick one of these seven bits, bit code words and hand it to him. And then I pick another seven bit code word and present uh, four bits of data. Why four bits? Because two to the fourth is 16. There are 16 total code words, right? If there were only two code words, then I could hand him one and it would be a zero, and I could hand him the other and it would be a one, right? If, I, if we have a set of two to the fourth uh, code words, then every him represents four bits. So we're, we've expanded our, uh, our number of bits that, that we have to transmit or store by, uh, from, from four bits to seven. Every time we want to communicate four bits, we're actually transmitting seven bits. Redundancy provides us with some benefit. So, uh, and I have these kind of in a jumble here because I didn't put them in any particular order. Um, there are, like, I'm not, I'm not specifying represents what four-bit value. There is a standard mapping that is typically used in all this mapping to like a, a clever methods of decoding based on that mapping, but we don't really care about that right now. All we care about for this project is their words, and each one is seven bits long. Uh, because there are 16, this code codes four bits of data per code word, and the last thing that's uh, the last characteristic that we're, we find interesting is what's called the Hamming distance. Uh, and this is just another use of the word Hamming that comes from the same guy. Um, the Hamming distance is, is the, like between two code words, the Hamming distance is the number of bits that differ. So if you take, say, on the left-hand side, the upper left, the top two 
uh, in the left column there, those two codes differ from each other by three bits, which means the Hamming distance from one to the other is three. Uh, if you take the next pair, like the, on the left-hand side of the screen, the, the second and third, those two codes differ by four bits. So the Hamming distance between that pair of codes is four. If you take every single possible combination of two codes on this screen, you should find that the Hamming distance between any two is three or more uh, in this particular case. But uh, the minimum Hamming distance of this code is three, which means, means if a bit is flipped, then, uh, uh, then it, we still actually know what data were transmitted. We know if a, a one bit flipped doesn't, this turn, doesn't want to make one of these codes turn into another one of these code words, right? You have to flip at least three bits to make one of these code words become another code word. So seven, the number of code words is two to the fourth, or uh, 16, and the minimum Hamming distance is three. And what that Hamming distance gives us is these properties. If we have flipped, then we can correct an error when we read this code or receive this code, uh, and it's had one bit flipped. It's only one bit away from away from one valid code word. There's, o there's only one code word in the set that it, that could be that we received with one bit flipped. So that allows us to correct a single bit error. So this is an error correcting code. If there are two bits flipped, we could see that the, what we received is not a valid code word. But if we try to correct it, we'll probably, we, we may end up with the wrong one. We, we're not able to correctly correct that, uh, that bit error, that dual bit error. And if there are three bits flipped, well, we might actually receive a valid code word that was not the intended data. Uh, so, so we completely fail, we, we can get we can get an undetected error if there are three bits flipped in a code word. Um, and so this is just like the classic introductory coding theory, I think. Um, but the, uh, it, it, you can imagine that if we added more bits, if we had, if this were in uh, 843, um, or if we, if we were just to add an eighth, uh, bit onto every code word, we can actually then actually, in, in, it might, maybe you can make an 844 code or a 944 or a 945 or, right, there are all kinds of different sets of code words that we could come, come up with. And the more of that set of code words, uh, the more capability we will have to, for error correction and error detection. Um, and those are the two properties that people generally look for when they're selecting codes. So what if you were going to implement Hamming code, the 743 Hamming code? Uh, if you wanted to create the, the transmitter of this uh, code, then you would probably do it with a lookup table. Because all you have to do is, is take four bits of your data and do a, a, a lookup table with 16 elements. That, right, really simple. If you, were doing an, uh, if you were going to implement a decoder, you could also use, it has to be a bigger lookup table, right? Because when you receive or read those seven bit code words, there are two to the seven for what you get. So you need two to the seventh or 128 elements in your table. It is often overlooked because, uh, for various reasons. One is the fact that this is a pretty short code. A lot of a lot of systems use codes with longer code words. And so if you have like a 30-bit word, uh, the lookup table method becomes less practical, right? But if you, have a sh if you have shorter codes like this, the lookup table method is extremely practical and no reason to worry at all about any of the complex math of decoding. Uh, and that's what much of coding theory is concerned with. It's clever techniques of decoding and clever techniques of generating codes or choosing code words that those clever techniques of decoding can work. And we're ignoring all of that for this project. We don't care about any of that. All we care about is 
There are codes that consist of sets of code words that have these particular basic properties, their length, uh, how many, really all we care about. So uh, we think of that as kind of the, the lookup table approach to decoding is kind of a brute you can implement the thing, and it works just fine as long as you have enough memory to implement it, uh, as long as your, your code word length is short enough for that to be practical. So we're interested in this brute force method of of coding and decoding, uh, and we're also, because of that, it frees us to take a brute force method to actually discovering new codes or producing those sets of code words that have properties that we're looking for. So that's what we're doing. We're just, we're just brute force searching through all the possible code words we might use to see if we can find sets of code words that are interesting to us or have particular properties. Uh, so let me give you an example of one of the, this is the smallest, the shortest, simplest code that we found that has this particular property I'm about to describe. This isn't a particularly useful code uh, because it's, it's very short, but it illustrates, this is the simplest example we found that illustrates the property we're interested in. So here's a, here's a 532 code. So what does that mean? It means every code word is five bits long. There are two to the three uh, code words, eight code words, which means that, every, and the minimum Hamming distance is two. Now, two is not enough to, imp, to actually correct any bit errors, but it is enough for error detection. Uh, and so, the, uh, the, on its own, this code is not, has this interesting property that it can be split into two. We can take four of those code words and put them into one group, and we can take four of those code words and put them into another group. And each group has a minimum Hamming distance of two. But between the groups, there's a minimum Hamming distance of three. If you take any code word from the left and any code word from the right and look at how many bits differ between that pair of code words, you'll find that they differ by at least three bits. We call this property isolation, that these two complementary codes are isolated from each other by, uh, by three bits. So, in this, in this case, the, these subcodes, these complementary subcodes, um, each one has a Hamming distance of two, but the, uh, the two subcodes are separated by an isolation of three. So uh, I call this an isolated complementary binary linear block code, which is quite a mouthful, but I haven't thought of a better name yet. Uh, the uh, two uh, to the third power, so eight code words. Uh, the minimum Hamming distance is two, and then I've added on this extra little uh, number, the minimum isolation is three. So what happens here if, a, if you were to encode receive that transmitted information? Uh, if, there were, if, if you received something that has one bit flipped, you could detect that error. Uh, if you receive something that has a bit, uh, two bits flipped, uh, you might get an error that you can't detect. Right? You might get a code word from that subcode, but it will be an isolated error. You will not actually receive, you will not think that you got a code word from the other subcode. It requires at least three bits flipped in a single code word, break isolation, and erroneously receive something from the other set of code words. So, Breaking, and so if you use this for encapsulating data, if those subcodes for the inner data and one subcode for the outer data, you are uh, highly unlikely to ever uh, situation where encapsulation is broken, uh, where you incorrectly think that some inner data is outer data, uh, is outer data, or vice versa. So, uh, is this where you take over? It, it will All right. Be, yeah. Okay, you can, you can do it all if you like. Um, so we, we wrote a little C program that is also on, on the GitHub, uh, GitHub repository if you want to go and have a look. Um, my fault. It's, it's, it is, yeah, Mike, Mike sent, me this, uh, sent me this file and he's like, oh, it's like a, a thousand lines of C. You just, you just read through it and, and work out how the project works. And, uh, and then he went on vacation and I'm just like reading it and going, I don't understand, why does this function take 12, 12 arguments? Um, so, yeah, <laughs> because you know what was going on. So I, uh, 
Python, which means it runs at significantly slower, but um, you can read it. So, you know, whichever you prefer. Um, and it, the, the C code and the Python version use a depth first for codes consisting of, of code words given the parameters that we provide at the beginning. So we say we want a 743 code or, or something along those lines. And we, um, we, we generate longer and longer um, codes and run through all the brute force, all the um, candidate values and eliminate the ones that don't match the, the appropriate Hamming distance and, and, and so on and so forth. And um, this actually is, is not particularly efficient, but it, it, that we, um, all of these groups of codes, and potentially lets us find codes that you wouldn't derive from an analytical method um, and have properties that we may not have found in, in other ways. Um, and so that's why, we, that's why we brute force it. I don't know, I don't know. I actually know how to run demonstrations on your right. laptop. Yeah. Yeah, so, so we're, we're doing a brute force methodically generating these codes, which is the traditional way. And part of the reason for that is to look for codes that are of um, arbitrary. So you can find a code that has um, a length that is not a power of two code words, um, which can be useful in some situations. Um, so let me see, is that, oh, that works, okay. So I just ran through a little search here using this C program, and, and what I was looking for um, in this case, I was trying to find codes that have uh, six bit code words and a, a minimum Hamming distance of three and a minimum isolate of three. So uh, I'm looking for, for pairs of subcodes that have this, this uh, particular Hamming distance and isolation. And just, just see like what's, what sets of possible codes are there that meet these criteria. Here's one subcode that is 10 code words, 10 code words. So we found, and you can see on the left hand side it prints out 20, 10, 10. 20 is just the sum of the two. So I have a 20 code word uh, code that consists of two 10 code word codes each of which has uh, a minimum Hamming distance of two, and these two subcodes have a, a minimum isolation from each other of three bits. So uh, it's a little bit interesting, Dominic just mentioned, that uh, um, we may be finding things that are not powers of two. Uh, here we have a 10 element code, whereas traditionally in these kinds of codes, it's most common to uh, use, say, only eight of those elements instead of ten information. But if you have ten elements, it's kind of hard to just kind of fit that to your binary data. So we're finding codes that may not have powers of, of two numbers of code words. But also we're finding codes that, uh, let me just run this again and pipe it here. We're finding codes that, that may not be the same number of code words in one sub the other. So for example, this fir these first ones we're finding have 22, uh, 22 codes in one code and then two code words in the second code. And I'm representing each code word here as a, just a decimal number. Uh, you know, there are a lot to save real estate. I'm just represent them at, representing them as decimal numbers because that's all they are is a, a six-bit number in this case. So. In this case, you could take 22 code words and say, that's my encapsulated data, and then or framing or metadata that's represented by this set of one-bit code words. That's possible. And going further down, uh, I like, this is kind of interesting. Here are some that have 20, it's 17 in one, sub, one subcode and four in the other subcode. So if, for example, we wanted to just throw out one of these 17, uh, we could take this pair of subcodes and say, okay, our, our encapsulated data are going to be represented four bits at a time out of these 16 code words. And then our uh, outer data is going to be represented uh, uh, by this pair or this set of, so, so we'll represent that four, uh, two bits at a time. You know, two bits at a time for one, four bits at a time for the other. That could be a, a useful implementation for some cases. Like the CSV file kind of follows that uh, example where you have 64 or 65 or however many uh, valid 
characters there are in the base64 uh, character set, all number of valid char characters like commas and so forth uh, for the delimiters. There's that kind of imbalance of characters in one subcode and few in the other subcode. That's the same kind of thing. Um, and so to give you another little example, Dominic's laughing because he's, I think he's, his comment to me yesterday was, what? Yeah, you well, know, you could have a... Uh, you could just take or you could compile two copies of it rather than editing the code, compiling it, <laughs> and running it. So if, anyone, if anyone's holding on to a schmoogle, <laughs> now would be the time. So just to give you an example, I'm, now I'm going to do something where I'm looking for like 8-bit code words. And this may not be as good an example. Did I not? Did you recompile it? Oh, you know, I didn't give it a, um, I didn't give it a, a name to, for the object file. Um, so this is an example where I'm trying to find 8-bit code words. And you can see that it's really slow. Um, it's trying, like, it's trying to find a set that has like 104 uh, in one code and two, in, at least two in the other code, subcode, right? And it's just kind of going down and going down and, and looking for the biggest codes that it can possibly find that meet these, uh, these criteria. Uh, and this is not going to complete uh, in any kind of reasonable time frame. Uh, but it illustrates the fact that we are exhaustively searching for these codes up to those limits. So like we've exhaustively searched for every possible code made out of six-bit code words that meet particular criteria. We've exhaustively searched meet certain criteria. Uh, I don't think we've yet exhaustively searched for, eight, for sets of eight-bit code words that meet these kinds of uh, We are proving the existence of codes up to, uh, 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 that, that have these properties. Or uh, if we had failed to find any at this point, uh, we would be disproving their existence up to certain code word length that we're trying to accomplish uh, with this project. So, so far we, we have actually found codes, uh, so we're not really disproving anything. But um, uh, that's our, our goal is to kind of Im improve this and try to find longer codes that are more generally useful um, because the longer they get, kind of the more interesting properties they have. You want to talk about that? Yeah, yeah, why not? So um, it's worth mentioning as well that uh, we did debate leaving it to run on Mike's laptop yesterday to search for 8-bit codes, and we forgot to plug it in. And uh, <laughs> so it got a certain way through the search, and then, uh, and then we came back to find the, the laptop off and uh, unhappy and hot. Um, so, so one of the ideas we have for, for or we're experimenting with at the moment is, is to move this algorithm onto an FPGA because there's there's a lot of uh, benefit we can gain from um, parallelizing the, the process, and that's where um, running this on, on FPGA will, will really come into its own. Um, and I'm now feeling a little bit guilty for mocking Mike's C code, because if you go to the repository, you'll see my Verilog, and it is <laughs> offensive. Um, and so one of the problems that we've come up against is we have a recursive algorithm. And it's quite a neat little recursive algorithm. And that's not a particularly easy thing to implement when you've got to specify the size of your layout on an FPGA at compile time. Um, and so it would, been, for many of these searches, it would involve working out what our max recursion was. And we do have a version of our, our script that will do that. We'll, it will only recurse to a certain length of code, and so on and so forth. But ideally, um, I think we'd like to find a, an algorithm that does, gets us the same thing, but we don't need to be recursive. Um, and when I tried to do that, I had to try and manage memory in Verilog, which was where it all went hideously wrong. Um, so, so that's something we're working on. That's something that doesn't quite work yet. And we're currently targeting that to uh, some Altera boards that we have for another project. Um, and then um, we're going to hopefully look for even larger codes using some uh, Pico hardware, I believe is the, is the plan. <laughs> Get a little nod from the, the Pico guys sat over there. Um, and, and the plan is that they have a, um, a can rent time on, and, and we plan to do that to look for even longer codes and try and find. Um, we're hoping that the longer these codes get, the, the more interesting properties we'll find for um, isolation and strange code sizes and, 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 and things like that. Um, 
So, do you, did you want to take this one or? Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah, all right. So, uh, basically, we, we think that error correcting codes, uh, error control codes in general, um, it, it, we've, the way we've seen them selected in the past is that people are, are choosing them based on their code rate and based on the, uh, which is like the, the efficiency, the number of bits you have to transmit versus how many bits of information you're conveying. Uh, also, the complexity of the decoder and the probability of an undetected error or the probability of a, an uncorrected error. Uh, those are kinds of the, the criteria that people use when they choose an error control code. But we think that there should be another criterion added to this list, that the probability of encapsulation breakage, uh, encapsulation breakage, then you completely prevent packet in packet, for example. Um, if you can prevent breakage of encapsulation in, uh, in other types of systems, you might prevent things like buffer overflows. Um, and so we think that, those are, that that's an important property. Um, and so we think any time you encapsulate data within other data, you should consider unambiguous encapsulation. Uh, I'm not saying you should go necessarily and, and like replace every place you use a CSV file with our base64 file format. Uh, but you might think about it. Um, it's definitely worth considering the, the property of unambiguous encapsulation and seeing if you can accomplish that in your system. Uh, and we hope that, that this project will uh, kind of shine a light on that, that design pattern a little bit and enable people to build systems that uh, are, are more resilient in the future. So we want to say thanks to the Langset community, the whole crew, because, ah, Sergey, welcome, uh, because um, it really is awesome stuff and, and really inspired our, our line of thinking here. Uh, also, thanks to the DARPA, DARPA Cyber Fast Track Program, Bit Systems, um, and Pudge for uh, helping us with this project. Uh, and thanks in advance, David, because we're going to use you uh, <laughs> soon. <laughs> uh, any any questions before we go? Anyone? What? Oh, <laughs> just shout it. So yeah, that, uh, Crispin, thank you. Uh, uh, Stack Canary, that that's definitely uh, a relevant uh, thing to bring up. Bring up, and uh, it's a, it's a good illustration of um, how uh, we're trying to promote a very general concept. Uh, that that uh, is an example of you heading in the same direction years ago. Thank you, thank you. Um, and and uh, also, there are all examples here and there from history, uh, including in communications protocols, um, where people have implemented something like unambiguous encapsulation, even if they haven't really thought about the general theory of it. Um, uh, and there's all kinds of interesting history of like telecommunications, like, like T1 signals that, you know, where people were accidentally breaking encapsulation to change things and essentially implement escaping uh, at the physical layer to communication systems and storage, data storage. I mean, we, we have places where we've seen this kind of breakage and fixing happening. Um, but we're hoping to, you know, get the conversation going about this as a general theoretical concept that in, in general all the time. Um, so thank you, Crispin. Anybody else? Sergey? Are we submitting it to the Langsec workshop? We, we probably are now. We probably are now, yes. <laughs> uh, uh, if, if anyone is wondering, uh, this is exactly the kind of effort that we want to see uh, at the Langsec workshop uh, that will be in San Jose in May. Uh, if you're interested, go to langsec.org uh, and yeah. uh, find the SPW workshop. Yeah, if you didn't hear that, langsec.org.
uh, workshop in May. So uh, we're going to try to make that happen, and um, we hope that anybody who's interested in this stuff uh, also checks that out. Um, because personally, I think that LangSec is uh, the most exciting thing going on in our field right now. Um, because there, every day we hear about things that are incredible failures and are often depressing. And Lang LangSec is a, uh, a ray of light that uh, provides hope for what we do, I think. Uh, so uh, I'll just think, leave it at that. Yeah, I think we need to yeah. go to the stage now. So All right. Let the next people come up. Thanks, everybody.